Um, today I'm going to do a little bit something different. I have a whiteboard, and I don't. Uh, I used to use it a lot more often when I preached. I haven't used it in a while. I'm going to use it today, if that's all right, with you as we jump into the Word. Father, as we open your Word, open our hearts, and just bless us again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Uh, I pray that everyone had a safe week as it was, um, you know, people was Halloween and people were out. I pray that no hurt, harm, or danger came to anyone, um, but that you were able to be with family and friends. And as we think about um, just this season as we transition into Thanksgiving, I, I was walking through the grocery store yesterday, Stephen, and they already had the sweet potatoes out. And uh, the, the marshmallows and the sugar and the, uh, the I mean, they, they were ready. They were like, Thanksgiving is here. And they had just piles and piles of the, the Thanksgiving stuffing and the classic uh, Thanksgiving um, menu. It was, they were laying it out. And so I said, this is, this is the best time of the year. Not because it's my birthday season, but because of Thanksgiving and then Christmas is soon to follow. And so we're super excited about this holiday season. Um, but today, I, I want to talk with you just a little bit up, uh, along the topic of the trouble, the trouble with staying, if you would just, if you would just indulge me for a few moments. Um, you know, this week, I was on my way to uh, take my daughter, um, our, our, our youngest daughter, Elise, had a doctor's appointment. Um, I think it was on Thursday, maybe Wednesday. Um, Oh, it was on Thursday. She had a doctor's appointment on Thursday. And so I, it was doctor's appointment was at 10 o'clock. And so we left the house around nine and we, I got her in the car. I was in the, our, our wife's car, the minivan, and we were driving down the road. And as we were driving down the road, um, the road was somewhat bumpy. We we're going down the hill, somewhat bumpy. The, the pavement wasn't the smoothest. And so we were just kind of bouncing along as we were driving down. And then all of a sudden, I heard something. Um, it, it didn't sound right. It sounded like something was going on. I don't know what exactly it was. Uh, I, like I ran over something, something small, but something that had a significant impact on the car. And so we kept driving. And all of a sudden, as we were driving down the road, I just heard this like this ticking sound, like a And I was like, man, what is that sound? And it kind of came louder and louder and louder. And so I, I pulled over. And as I pulled over and uh, inspected the vehicle, I, I went to the back. I, I saw immediately that while we were driving down the road, we apparently had picked up not a small, but a, a quite large nail that was in the road. And it was so large, it was protruding from the tire, and I could see it, and it, uh, there was no sensor. You know, on your car, it normally has like a tire pressure sensor if, there, if your air pressure is getting low. And the sensors were fine, and nothing was wrong. And so I said, well, maybe I can at least drive it to the tire shop and see what happens. And so I kind of got back on the road, and I went down, not even man, not even five seconds on the road, and it just it was getting louder. The, the, not, the sound of the of the nail hitting the road repeatedly over and over. I said, this is, I'm not going to be able to make it to the end of this block. Immediately, the tire pressure sensor came on, and I recognized I had to change the tire right then and there. So I pulled off into someone's driveway. I don't even know who it was, but I needed a flat surface. I pulled off into their driveway, and I uh, got out the requisite materials and equipment. I jacked the, the car up, and I took the tire off, and I put on the flat tire. And, and then while I was putting on the, the, the spare tire, I was putting on the spare tire. While I was putting on the spare tire, my daughter, Elise, in, insisted that she wanted to come out and to inspect what was going on. And so she came out, and she inspected the situation, and after she inspected the situation, she insisted I was, didn't know what I was doing, and she insisted that she help with the process, and so I actually was able to catch just a, a, a quick picture of her uh, helping, helping me uh, change the tire. She insisted on getting down there and showing me how it's done at three years old, and so I said, all right, you can, you can help, and uh, she was figuring out the pieces and the parts, and if you go to the next one, you can actually see in the background there the, the nail. You can see that? Yeah, that, it wasn't even a nail. It's like a bolt um, is sticking out of the tire there. I wasn't going to go very far on that. Put the spare on and was able to make it to the tire shop. Uh, as you can imagine, they said, we, we, we can't repair this tire. We had to get new tires, and and as I was sitting there at the tire shop, it just hit me that, you know, the reality is, is that I was driving to an appointment and along the way 
to this appointment, I picked up something that sent me in a different direction. We never made the doctor's appointment that day. Um, and what's interesting is that this bolt that I picked up, if you take this bolt in the right place, this bolt has a lot of use and can add a lot of value and will be a necessary component to keeping something together. However, in the wrong place, this same bolt will send you in an entirely different direction and will cost you significant money that you did not ex expect to spend, all because it's in the wrong place. It's funny because if you live life long enough, you too will realize, as I have, is that when you're driving down the road of life, along the way, you will pick up some things. And some of those things will help you, and some of those things will add value to you, and as long as some of those things are in the right place, it will be a benefit and even a blessing to you. But if you pick up some things that don't belong in your life, where you are in your road of life, then those same things that, you were that, that were at one point a blessing will turn to be a curse to you. You see, if I was building a house, then I would definitely want this bolt to play a role. Or if I was building a, a bed, I would definitely want and need this bolt. But if I'm driving down the road, I want to make sure that there are no nails and no bolts and no screws lying around anyway, be, anywhere because in the wrong place, it will cause significant damage. Do you know some of the things that you picked up throughout life? I, 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 since I've been in California about eight years now, I know something that I picked up from being here is, is greeting people with the saying, bro. Have you, does anyone else do that? That's like totally a Cali thing, right? What's up, bro? What's up, bro? <laughs> Totally, it may even be more so a Hispanic thing. I don't know. I mean, there's a whole lot of Hispanics out here, and I love it. It may be an Hispanic thing, but I remember, like, that's not something that you say, like, if you go down south, people are not, like, saying, what's up, bro? Like, no, that's, they say, dude, they say, man, they say anything else, but that, that is totally Cali all the way. Oh, I, I know, you know, some of us, when you're going through life, you pick up habits, and some of these are good habits, and, and some of them are, are not so good habits. Good habits would be you, you picked up the habit of maybe exercising, and so because you picked it up, you, you exercise now, maybe three or four days a week, or uh, some of us have picked up the lifestyle habit of eating healthy, and so we, we avoid certain refined sugars, we eat healthy, we, we abstain from a lot of processed foods, we, we pick up things along the way, and as we pick these things up, they help us. Some of us, though, unfortunately, maybe a bad habit is we pick up the bad habit of eating late. Do I have anyone in the house who eats past, like, their bedtime? Yeah, it, it's just something that, you know, at 9, 10 o'clock rolls around, and you open up the refrigerator looking for something to eat. And what's crazy is that while you're young, that's okay. <laughs> but when you get 40 and older, that, that food doesn't fall off of you as quickly as it did when you were younger. Or some of us picked up financial habits. Maybe you are accustomed to spending money how, whenever you need it, however much you need it, and it was never a problem. But then you found yourself in a different situation where you, now you're having to curtail your spending. And it's a little tough. I've been there before. Where it's a little tough where you're trying to have to actually live by a budget and make sure that you're following your financial goals and your financial plans. There are things that we pick up that are necessary. And yet what's interesting, as I was just kind of thinking and processing this, I was saying to myself, you know, the reality is that there are, Stephen, some things that you pick up early in life that at the time you actually need those things to survive. But later on in life, those same things that at one point were there for your survival are now there to cause you harm. So, for example, you may have grew up in a rough neighborhood, and so you may have had to pick up a way of speaking to people in a language and a disposition and how to carry yourself, and you needed that in order to survive. But now you're no longer in that environment, and so if you continue to engage in that type of decorum and behavior, it's going to actually be detrimental for you. I mean, some of us, you pick up habits along the way where when you were single— you know, it was, one, it was cool to stay out late and to do what you ever, whatever you wanted to do and you didn't have to tell anybody about your whereabouts or what you were doing or what was happening to you. You could just come and go as you please. Any single folk in the house? God bless you, right? You can just come and go without a word to anyone. But when you're married, if you try to 
bring those habits into your marriage, Captain Peel, you know there's going to be some issues. There's things that you can do at one point and at one stage in your life that are fine, but if you try to carry those things to another stage of your life, it simply will not work. And so it is also in the spiritual realm. The Bible talks about how that when we were in the flesh, we would just live however we wanted to live. And so before you knew Christ and before you were a a Christian, you would probably just live however you wanted to live. Some of us may have really struggled and maybe still struggle with some impatience. Do I got a witness in the house? A little bit of impatience or intemperance. Maybe some of us were fighters. And so whenever we found ourselves in a situation, we would never back down from a fight. Or we would never yield ground. We were, we were, all, we were ultra, ultra defensive. And yet, and yet, when you become a Christian, you recognize that I can't carry those same habits and those, those same behaviors with me into my new Christian experience. I have to change. And that's why, that's why the Bible really talks about this thing called being born again. Can you just turn to the person next to you in front of you and say, you've got to be born again. That is like what, what Jesus is really getting at in John chapter 3. When Nicodemus comes to him, and Nicodemus says, well, 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 tell me about this thing called eternal life. And Jesus says, listen, that if you're going to be, if you're going to come into the kingdom, you must be born again. And then he goes and he takes it a step further, where he doesn't just say, church, that you must be born again. He says, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. What Jesus is really trying to convince and to communicate to us and to Nicodemus, to us through Nicodemus, is that this thing called Christianity, that the the way you came into this world is not going to be the way you're going to go into the kingdom. But change has to happen. You have to be transformed. Paul says it like this, that be ye not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the essence of what it means to be born Again, born of water and born of spirit. Now, what I find interesting is that Paul, not Paul, but Jesus does not say is that you must be born of religion. He doesn't say say you must join a church or you have to subscribe to a certain set of doctrine or dogma. No, no, this this is not the essence of what he's trying to communicate. We have constructed this thing called religion. And we've constructed in order to systematize and standardize our beliefs and our behavior so that we can try to hold people to a certain standard. But but really at the heart of it, what Jesus is saying is that you must step into a relationship with me. And this relationship with me that you step into isn't governed by rules and regulations. This relationship that you step into is purely governed by my Holy Spirit. And at the heart of what my Holy Spirit does is he infuses in you a love for me and for other people. That is the heart of what it means to be born again. Whereas before I was in sin and I was uh, totally all about myself and my needs and what I wanted and very self-centered, when I become a Christian now, I recognize it's not about me, it's not about my wants, but it's about how can I bless others and how can I add value to other people and how can I live my life so that God is glorified. That's why he says, let your light shine so that men might see your good works and glorify your father. And so at the heart of this thing, he says, listen, this thing, this Christian walk, it's all about being willing to let go of some things and to embrace what God is calling you into. And in order for you to embrace what God is calling you into, You have to be willing to leave where you are. You cannot stay, but you must. You must leave. This is what God is calling us to do. In fact, in Mark, he describes it like this. He says that you can't put new wine into old skins. He says, if you put new wine into old skins, he's like, the new wine will ruin, will ruin the skins and the wine will spill ev- everywhere. Okay, so um, I don't know what in here drinks wine. And so, uh, okay, <laughs> I know some people in here don't drink wine. Uh, so so, so let, me, let, me, let me just try to bring it to you. And, and if you do drink wine, I'm sure you don't drink it out of skins. Um, if you do, come see me. Uh, that's interesting. But if we were to translate it, he was essentially saying, like, no one puts, like, 
freshly squeezed orange juice in a dirty cup. Right? He's like, no one puts, you like that one, right? He says, no one puts freshly squeezed orange juice in a dirty cup. Because if you put your orange juice in a dirty cup, he's like, essentially, you're, you're going to ruin the orange juice. And, and no one's going to want the orange juice because it's in a dirty cup. And you're going to waste this, this juice. And so what he's really communicating to us is that he's saying, listen, I want to do something new in your life. Say new. I want to do something new in your life. But in order for me to do something new in your life, you have to be willing to, like, change the container and change the, the, the systems and change your mentality. Like, like, I can't do something new if you keep on holding on to where you've been and to where you've come from. You must be willing to leave. And so as I think about my life and our church and where God is calling us, it's been becoming increasingly clear that in order for us to really step into what God truly desires of us, we must be willing to let go of some things. One author says it like this, that you can't stay where you are and go with God, but you have to be willing to leave. And so now this is, this is the heart of it. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with staying where you are if that's where you want to be. But if you want to follow God, you have to be willing to leave. And so I, I, I was looking through the text this week, and, and I stumbled upon Genesis in chapter 12. And I want to read this passage to you in Genesis in chapter 12. And uh, it's on the screen, and this is, this is really the story of Abraham. So if you know anything about Abraham, Abraham is the father of faith. And what that means is that Abraham was willing to, to, to sacrifice his son Isaac. Do you all remember the story at all? Right? And so Abraham, one day, uh, God came to Abraham. He was like 75 years old, and Abraham said, Ab God said, Abraham, you're going to have a child. And Abraham had no children up until this point. And so God is like, you're going to have a child. And Abraham, are you, you, are you sure you got the right person? I'm 75. I'm old. Um, you know, my wife, she's not, not too far below me. She's 65, 70. Are you sure we're going to be able to have kids? I mean, I think she's past the childbirthing age. And, you know, her body's basically shut down. And, and my body's pretty much shut down too. And God's like, no, you're going to have a, a son. And you're going to call him Isaac. His name will be Isaac. And so, and so Abraham... Uh, against all science and, and biology, uh, he believed God, his wife not so much, but over time they actually gave birth to this son, this child named Isaac. And then one day God told Abraham to go and to sacrifice Isaac, to actually put him on an altar and to kill him as a sacrifice unto God. Now that's like strange and we would call not just 911 and CPS, but we would call everybody if you tried to do that to your child. And so it's not something that is relevant to us in, in our day and age, in, our, in this context. But back then, sacrifices, not human sacrifices, but animal sacrifices, was something that they did. And so here God tells Abraham, I want you to go and I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac. And so Abraham, you know, he, he has reservations as any parent would, but he takes his son to Mount Moriah and he, he's standing there and he, puts all, he pulls out an altar and, 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 and at the altar he, he, he binds his son and he lays his son on the altar and he's about to sacrifice him. And then all of a sudden, a ram shows up just across the way. And God then says, Abraham... Do not sacrifice your son, for I have provided a ram. And that act, Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son, gave Abraham the title father of faith. Because who in their right mind would be willing to sacrifice their child? Abraham said, God, I will follow you no matter where you are calling me to go. But before Abraham got there, Abraham was somewhere else that God had called him to. And I want to look at it in the text in Genesis in chapter 12. Genesis in chapter 12, the text says in verse 1, Then the Lord said to Abraham, or Abraham, before his name was changed, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a what? Come on, I will make you into a what? A great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt, or I will curse, curse those who curse you, she's saying. All the families of the earth will be blessed, he says, through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abraham was how old? 
75 years old when he left Haran, and he took his wife Sarai, uh, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken with his household at Haran. He took them, and he headed for the land of Canaan, where the Lord had called him. So here we see Abraham. He is 75 years old, and God, God is, at the very beginning, God is calling Abraham to leave. He's saying, Abraham, I want you to pack your belongings. I want you to take all the stuff that you have, and I want you to go. Now, what's interesting is that around 75, what are you trying to do when you're 75 years old? You're trying to chill. <laughs> you're like, listen, uh, uh, my retirement is about to kick in. Uh, I, I, I paid off the house. Um, I got my cattle, I got my bank, I got all my finances in order. You talking about you want me to do what? I mean, this is, this is almost like, I mean, imagine if you were living in Texas, right? And, you know, and I say Texas because generally the cost of living is a little bit lower. And God is like, man, you, you've done well. You got, you know, some acres and some, some livestock and you got a good business. And God comes to you and says, I want you to take all of that you have, pack it up, and I want you to move to Hollywood. <laughs> you'll be like, uh, like the most expensive place in California, Bay Area, San Diego County. I want you to move. I mean, this was like mind-blowing for Abraham. Now, we can read the text, and, we can, and to us, it doesn't really make much sense, but just, just imagine if one day God came to you through your spouse or family member and said, let's pack up and let's just get in the car and drive. You will look at them and be like, have you lost your mind? You want, you want to drive? No, okay, tell me where. I'm not sure where. Just, just go. This is, this is essentially what Abraham, what God called Abraham to do. He said, Abraham, if you go back and look at the text, he said, Abraham, he said, leave your native country. Not just leave your native country. He says, leave your, your relatives and your father's family. And go to the land where I, will, where I will show you. So not just Abraham are you leaving, but you're leaving your community. You're leaving your safety. You're leaving all that you have established. You're leaving your, your friends and your, and, your, and your businesses. And you're leaving everything, and you're just going. But this is what God promises Abraham, right? God says, but Abraham, he says, verse 2, I will make you into a what? Uh, go back one, go back one, verse two. He says, uh, he says, I want you to leave your fathers, I will show you, and he says, I will make you into a what? A great nation, go on. And then he says, he says, I will, uh, I will bless you, and I will make you famous, and I will, um, I, I will be a, you will be a blessing to others, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those. And so what God says is, Abraham, leave, and when you leave, he's essentially then saying, I, uh-oh, he's essentially saying, I will bless. He's saying, I want you to leave. And then once you leave, Abraham, my promise to you is that I will bless you. Now, this makes sense on paper. But in my life, and I'm sure probably in your life, this is not the order that we live our lives. No, 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 no. We say to God, God, bless me first, and, and then I'll leave. We say, we say, God, like, open the windows of heaven and bless me and, and pour out the blessings and, and add favor to my life and, and, yeah, make me famous, God, right? And, and bless those who bless me, and God, you can curse those who curse me too. That's, I'm all right with that too. Amen. Like, if you, if you give me all of that, then I will I will leave. Then I'll commit. Then I'll follow you. Then I'll surrender to you. Then I'll, 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 I'll return a faithful tithe. Then I'll do all of these things. And yet that's not, that's not how God operates. And as we see in Abraham's life, that's not how God operated with Abraham. But God was saying to Abraham, no, I want you to go first, trust my word, follow me with all of your heart, and as you are going, I will Bless you. How many times have you and I not really trusted God because we were waiting for God to show us something? 
How many times have we withheld from fully surrendering our hearts to God or fully to depending on him in a situation because from our perspective, it didn't make sense. And from our perspective, we weren't sure how it was going to work out. And so we went ahead and took control of the situation. How many relationships have we been in and held on to that we know good and well we should have released long ago, but because we didn't know what was coming after and we felt like maybe nothing was coming after, we held on to what we had. How many times have we made financial decisions that probably weren't the best financial decisions because we didn't fully understand what God was trying to do in our lives? Uh, You don't got to say amen. I'll say amen for you. Amen, pastor. We do this all the time. And yet this, this fundamentally is how God has always operated in the Bible, I mean, isn't one of the most, the, the, the most critical texts that we've ever read, um, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. Is essentially saying, trust in me and just follow me. Leave everything that you have, surrender totally to me, cast your life on me, and if you just do that, then I will lead you, I will guide you, I will bless you. It doesn't happen the other way around. This is the formula for living a life of faith where we say, God, I trust you, and now I will walk. I trust you, now I will walk. I trust you, now I will walk. But if you, if you wait to see if, the fo- if your footing is stable before you trust him, you are not living the life of faith. So, God says, Abraham, leave, and I will make you. And so the text says that Abraham, he, he departed. He says, God, I will follow. I will go. I will leave. Have you heard of that saying, that, that, old, that old poem? Maybe you can finish it. Uh, the, the, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God won't. Have you ever heard that before? Y'all, don't, y'all look at me like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. The will of God will never take you someplace where the grace of God won't. Y'all don't know that at all? Okay, we got to. Okay, so there's this old saying that says, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God can't keep you. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's coming back, it's coming back, it's coming back. It also goes on to say, the will of God will never take you where the arms of God cannot support you. Or the will of God will never take you where the riches of God cannot supply your needs. Or the will of God will never take you where the power of God cannot endow you. Like there's this concept, there's this principle where we believe fundamentally that that if God is calling you to leave, that wherever he's calling you to leave from and wherever he's calling you to leave to, that he will be able to keep you and bless you. And I truly believe that because at the end of the day, God is calling all of us into this thing that I want to coin as this word, which is called sentness, where God is calling all of us to be sent into something. It's called sentness. He wants us to live a life of sentness, where we are sent into our jobs, and we're sent into our communities, and we're sent into our our families, and we're sent into, and we're sent into um, different areas. We're sent into different relationships and different communities where we are actually always leaving. We're always going out because God is calling us into a life of sentness, where we don't stay where we are, where we're comfortable, but where we go and where we are sent to do something great for God. Like, this is the same principle that we read in Matthew in chapter 4 when Jesus is walking by the shore one day and he's building his followers, he's building his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 4, I just want to read this text real quick. Verse 18 says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, uh, and Andrew, his, his brother, casting net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then this is what Jesus said to them. Jesus said to them, you can go to the next slide. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. This is the core principle. Again, we see Jesus doing the same thing. Jesus is like, listen, leave your nets. Don't stay where you are. 
leave what you have and follow me. And if you follow me, I will then bless you. And what they did was they immediately, they immediately followed. Now, what is at stake? What is at stake? What would you be risking if you chose to stay? I, I was thinking about it, and so I came up with a list, and we're just going to put it here. Uh, this is our, our stay list, right? So if Abraham or the disciples, if they chose to stay and to not follow God, what would they be holding on to? Fish? <laughs> uh, stability? Uh, we'll call it stability. They would be holding on to Safety? What else would they be holding on to? Comfort? What else would they be holding on to? Ah, uh, routine said like status quo. What else would they be holding on to? Okay, community. Uh, which would be stability, safety, comfort, uh, kind of like what they're used to in that moment, right? Uh, they, would also be, they would also be holding on to control. So they would be able to control what's happening around them. They would be holding on to uh, these, their own expectations of what's happening and what's not going to happen. Like this is, a very, this is like the list that all of us work all of our life to get. We want stability and we want safety and we want comfort. Uh, maybe not so much status quo, but we definitely want control. Does anyone here not want control? Uh, we definitely want expectations. But along with this list, when you choose to stay and not follow God with all of your heart, there's also, there's also one other word I want to put up here, um, that when you stay, you are also holding on to, uh, my marker is getting a little weak on me, boredom. The same old, same old. Nothing new. And yet, if you go, if you follow God, what would you be getting if you go? Opportunity. I like to call it, I like to call it, one thing is sacrifice. Sac, re, how do you spell it? Sacrifice. Every step of the way, when you follow God, there is sacrifice. But along with the sacrifice, you also get blessings and favor. And there's risk. But there's also reward. And it requires faith. You get these things. There is some, there is some, some fear in this thing. But there's also adventure. I mean, imagine we would never be reading about Abraham today if he would have stayed. And the question is, when you look at your life, are you going or are you staying? When you look at how you carry yourself from one day to the next, and I'm talking to Christians, and so I'm not assuming that anyone in here is a Christian, but even in your Christianity, some of us can still live a stay type of life as Christians. Because just because I believe in God up here and I've accepted Christ as my Savior up here doesn't mean I believe in him right here. And doesn't mean that that belief has translated into how I carry myself every single day. Are you living a go life or are you living a stay life? Are you taking, uh, taking risk and experiencing faith? And are you confronting each day, recognizing that, man, there's a little fear in this situation, but I believe that God is for me. Who shall be against me? And now, granted, I'm not calling anyone to sell all of your possessions or that you need to move to a distant country. No, I, I hope you stay here and relove with us in Orange County. But, but, but what sentness off actually means at its heart is that I live every day in my community. And because I live every day as a missionary in my community, I recognize that there's going to be times when I must sacrifice, and yet I'm going to receive blessings, and God's favor is going to be upon me. And there are significant risks along the way. But I also believe that there's significant reward, and God's favor, and his faith, and I will, I will step into what God has in store for me. Thank you. Use the green one. Are you living a go life 
Or are you living a stay life? When you encounter your neighbors and new situations, are you living go? Or are you living stay? There's a friend of mine I know, haven't talked to him in a while, still call him a friend, old friend. He, he told me one day, and I may have shared this story when I first came. He told me one day, he said, man, he said, Seth, you won't believe it, but um, God is just, God has called me and him and his wife, and they got like five kids. He said, God has called me and my family. He's, uh, and this is when we were in Chattanooga. He said, God has called me and my family to, to move to, um, I think he's at Bakersfield. I said, are you sure that's the Lord? <laughs> uh, he said, God is calling, he said, God was calling us to go to Bakersfield. He said, I don't know why, but I just felt God in my spirit was saying, I want you to move to Bakersfield. He says, I don't know anyone in Bakersfield. He said, I don't know any churches in Bakersfield. He said, I have no community in Bakersfield. But every time I just think about God, where are you leading my life, I just get this overwhelming sense that he's saying, Take your family, take your kids, and move to Bakersfield. So he's like, God, uh, I want to leave you, but I got some significant, I want to leave and go where you're calling me, but I got some significant, just as anyone would, some challenges with that. So as he was wrestling and praying about it in his spirit, one day, him and his family, they decided to go to breakfast, Trish, and so they went to IHOP. And so they went to IHOP, and they were sitting around the table, all seven of them, because he has like five kids. And uh, they're sitting around the table, and um, the, the meal is really crowded. I don't know if it's Sunday morning. It's really crowded, and so the meal's taking a little bit longer. And so he says, hey, you know, family, let's just, let's just have worship right here. And so him and his five kids and his wife, they just like, in their own little booth, they just start having their own little testimony service and talking about the goodness of God. And I don't know if they were singing any songs, but they were sharing scriptures or favorite scriptures. And they were just talking about God amongst themselves. Well, the waitress came and she took their order and they, you know, they kept talking about God and just kind of testifying and, and praying together in their own little booth and not disturbing or bothering anyone. And then all of a sudden the waitress came back with the food and they ate their food and the food was good. And then, and then when it was time to go, the waitress came up to them and she was like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. You you guys can go ahead and go. And he was like, um, uh, I'll, I'll take the bill. <laughs> uh, she's like, no, no, don't worry about it. She said, um, the, the, the family that just left, who was sitting behind you, they were just so impressed by your family worship that they covered your bill for you. And as she told him this, he heard the voice of the Lord say to him, that is how I will take care of you. And it was confirmation that when you leave and follow God, you will experience the blessings of God. And there will be risk, and there will be fear, but there will also be adventure, and there will also be blessings, and there will also be favor. So the question is, are you living a stay life, or are you living a go life? Well, Pastor, okay, I hear what you're saying, um, but, uh, I mean, I don't feel God is calling us to move, praise the Lord, to Bakersfield. Um, I, don't, I don't feel that. In fact, I don't feel God is calling us to move anywhere, Pastor. So, so what does a go life really look like if, if he's not calling me to leave my area? I mean, Abraham, he told him to leave his country. I don't feel like God's calling me to leave Southern California. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, uh, but, so how do you live a go life? How do you live a go life if he's not actually telling you to relocate and to move to a different area? Well, you live a go life in how you interact with people. Am, am, I, am I leveraging all of the resources and all of the material possessions and all of my time and my house and everything I have in order to live a go life where I'm sacrificing and I'm pouring into other people and I'm letting my light shine and I'm meeting people and I'm trying to build relationships and leverage the time and the job and everything I have for the purpose of God's kingdom or am I more concerned about my 401 and my safety and my comfort and status quo and keeping control of my situation and not letting anyone in and not really letting my life Light shine. Just because God may not be calling you to leave Southern California doesn't mean you can't live a go life. Where every day you wake up and you recognize that God is calling you, He is sending you into community.
See, let me just give you this and then we'll be done. Um, when, when you think about God, God, God is literally calling us into four places. The first is God is calling us into what I want to say culture. He's calling us into the culture. Now, I recognize that this may not sit well with everyone and ruffle some feathers, and so we may just have to agree to disagree, but I firmly believe that when I read the word of God, that God is calling us as Christians into the world. He's not calling us to run from the world. He's not calling us to avoid the world. Now, I do know the Bible says that we should love not the world. Y'all know that text? Love not the world, neither the things of the world, for the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, right? They're, they're perishing, they're passing away. Um, so don't love the world. So I know God is calling us not to love the world, but I also know that John 3.16 tells us that for God so love the world. So how is it on one hand, God is saying, I love the world, but then on another hand, he's saying, but don't love the world. Well, what is he talking about? Well, we know fundamentally that when God says, I so love the world, he's talking about, I love people. I love the people of this place so much that I'm going to send my son to die. Not just to die for them, but I'm going to send my son to immerse himself in the culture of this world. Jesus did not come as an angel. He did not come as a heavenly being. He came as a Jew, walking on a dusty ground, engaging in all the Jewish practices, wearing the Jewish garments, engaging in the Jewish lifestyle, eating Jewish food, totally engaged in culture. And I believe that God is calling us to lean in to culture, not to be afraid of the world, not to try to think that, okay, we're Adventists, we're Christian, so we don't associate with the world. No, but to step into the world and to let our light shine in the world. Because in order for light to shine, there must be darkness. And God is calling us into dark places and then to set ourselves on fire, not literally, but figuratively, so that we can burn brightly for the cause of God. And so I say, go to every place where people are. Wherever people, wherever people gather, go there and gather with them, regardless of whatever day they're gathering on. Surround yourself with people. And when you are around people, love people. He's calling us into culture, number one. Number two, God is calling us into community. That he doesn't want any of us to be an island, but he wants us to leverage our homes for places where people can gather for community. To, to, to connect in life groups and small groups, to connect it at the water cooler, to connect in the break room, to connect uh, at the parks, to, to, to surround ourselves and to live in community. Now, I understand that some of us may be saying, well, Pastor, I am introverted as I am introverted myself. But yet even us introverts, God is still calling us into community. And I would expect the introverts to say amen, but they're too introverted to say amen. So I will say amen for all of the introverts. Amen. God is calling us into community, into relationship with people. We cannot live life alone. We have to meet people. The third thing God is calling us to, into is God is calling us into Christ. Now, this might be a given, but I just feel it's necessary to say that me stepping into culture and me stepping into community is because I have first stepped into Christ. And I am hidden in Christ Jesus, which means I'm not, I'm not operating in my community and in my culture out of a sense of guilt or a sense of, of, of obligation. I'm operating inside of my community because I have been compelled by the love of Christ. I am immensely in love with Christ. So no matter where I go, Christ just oozes out of me, and I can't help it. It's just in my blood. You know how some people, you hang around them, and they just have a, a bodily odor, and you try to put some perfume or cologne upon it, but it's, you need a little bit more? No one in here. Y'all smell good. 
All right? Don't look at the person next to you. They, they smell good. But there's some people, they just got this, what do they call it, B.O.? You just got, you, God has blessed you with a strong scent. Christ should be our B.O. So when I show up, it's just, it, just, it just oozes out of my body. And not because I'm preaching to everyone or I'm beating them over the head with the word, but just because, like, I just love people. And I might not love people, but I love people. And if you are a child of God, if you are made in his image, then I feel honored to showcase God's love to you because Christ is oozing out of me. And the third thing that God calls us into is God calls us into conflict. Some might call it tension. That as you and I live this life, there is this constant tension between the world and God, and I am in this constant battle where I am trying to showcase the love of God to this dying world. And in doing that, there will be conflict along the way. But I'm not afraid of the conflict. I don't run from the tension, but I recognize that not everything in life is going to be solved. There's going to be just some situations that I just have to manage this tension. I have to manage this conflict, and I'm going to manage it by putting on love and putting on God's grace. And so even if I have not been called to leave Southern California. I have been called into culture. I have been called into community. I've definitely been called into Christ. And God is always pulling us into conflict, into tension. So are you going to live a go life or are you going to live a stay life? Go life. You musicians can come, Trish, you can have them come. Are you going, to, are you going to, to leverage all that you have and say, God, I will follow you. And I trust that as I take a step out there, that you will be a hedge of protection around me and that you will, you will lead me and you will guide me. And I will live, I will live a sentness life. So my question Ultimately, in my appeal, is what is God calling me to go to? For some of you, it, it may be God calling you to a different area, location. Others of you, God may be calling you to a different job. He might be saying, this is not where you want you to be. Some others of you, God may be calling you, all of us, he calling you just, just to go across the street to meet your neighbor. Maybe do like, uh, uh, you all remember Tim, the two-man tailor? What was the name of that show? Uh, what was it called? Tool Time. Tool Time. And you know Wilson? We still know who Wilson is. He would just go to the fence, and him and Wilson would have conversations, and you would never see Wilson's face. Maybe God is calling you to have a, 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 a fence conversation with your neighbor. You see him out there all the time, doing their yard, trimming the hedges. Maybe God is saying, don't stay in your house and watch them, but go and have a conversation with them and engage them. He's calling you to cross the street, to knock on doors. Maybe calling you to go across a cubicle, to touch someone, to speak to someone. I don't know where God is calling you to go, but I know that if you're a Christian, God is calling you to go. And it's just a matter of, am I willing to embrace the word of God over my life and go where he is leading me? Or do I'm going to pull back and play it safe? And my prayer is that you would go. You know, we've been talking about our campaign for the city. And there's still time to sign up to say, you know what, I'm going to go and be for my four. I'm going to stand in the corner of my friends and my family who need me. You can sign up outside of the Connections tent. You can sign up online at our website for the city. Go to our church website. But more than just signing up and getting a T-shirt once you sign up, it's signing up your heart 
to say, I want to be for people. And I want to go. So that when Christ comes again, he will look at me and he will say, my child, because you went, you went to those who were hungry, you went to those who were naked, you went to those who were in prison, you went to those who were sick. Because you lived a go life, come. Come inherit all that my Father has in store for you. Now, I don't go to be saved, but there are rewards for going. And when you follow God with all of your heart. And there's nothing wrong with staying, but you will just be missing so much if you stay. So if you want to go with me, I want to invite you to stand, and I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, my prayer for your people is that we might live lives of go. Where we leverage all that we have for your kingdom, for your glory. Lord, I'm aware that there are people in the house of God right now who themselves are struggling in their own faith, they're struggling in their finances, they're struggling in their relationships, in their marriage, they're struggling with their children as parents, they're struggling with their health. And yet even in our, in our struggle, God, I still feel you calling us to leverage our struggle to be a blessing to someone else, to go. So, Spirit of the living God, empower your people with confidence and with boldness to know that there is so much in store for your people when we follow you with all of our hearts. That there is adventure and there is destiny and there is excitement and joy, and yet it also requires sacrifice, and there is fear. But God, we want to live bold, crazy, audacious lives for you. So may we let our light shine. May we follow you with all of our hearts. And no matter who we encounter or where they might be, May we showcase the love of our Savior to them. Father, I pray for that individual who's wrestling in their faith. They're not sure if they believe in you. They're not sure why they're here. God, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, that you would let them know that they're here because you have a special calling that you placed on them, that you love them with an everlasting love that your coming is so near and so soon you don't want them to perish and you are inviting them home. Father, we thank you for this invitation and may we go forth now with courage and with boldness conquering that which you have set before us. In Jesus' name, let the church of God say amen. And amen, amen.